Hello there, friends. Welcome back. I have a few old United States coins in front of me today. I mentioned these coins once to you before, actually, over a year ago. The second video I did on this channel was called Treasure Chest, and we looked at the coins in a small cedar box that belonged to my mother. But I mentioned that there were some older coins in the box that I removed beforehand because I thought that they would make a good video on their own. And these are those coins. So, over a year later, we're finally getting around to uh, taking a closer look at these older coins. There's a couple of things that I hoped we could do with these in this video. One thing, of course, is to listen to them. I want to try to always have the sound of these coins in the background. And that's because All but one of the coins that we're going to look at today are made of 90% silver. And to my ears, silver coins just sound different in the hand than modern coins do. To me, modern coins sound kind of pingy, whereas silver, to me, sounds somehow kind of flat or clacky sounding. These are not very good words to describe. what I hear, but they'll have to do. And the other thing that I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the engravers that work to create the artwork that's on these coins. You probably know by now that I've got a bit of a inquisitive streak when it comes to that sort of thing. It probably came up in my um, album collection video as well as the space mission stamps video. This notion that I'd like to find out a little bit about the behind the scenes of things like this, especially when there's human creativity at the core of something, especially when they are 
practical, everyday things, and the fact that a person, a real flesh and blood person, might have been the starting point for such a thing is, is often lost when we see the things every day or we interact with them in a very non-artistic context. So, I've got some bits of paper off, off frame to the right, and they are the pictures of the eight sculptors or engravers that were responsible for the designs on the coins that we're going to look at today. And I'm not going to try to give in-depth biographies of these men. And I'm also not going to try to give a detailed historical accounting of these coins, but I thought maybe if we mention one or two interesting things about the engravers and one or two interesting things about the coins, well, perhaps that would be a nice way to spend some time together in this video. So why don't we just start with one? The biggest ones are these dollars. I have two different types of dollars here and we'll try to get nice close-ups. Let's start with the dollars that look like this. You're going to see some recurring themes on these coins. One is that you will almost always see a depiction of liberty on the front of the coin, which is called the obverse of the coin. That's this part. And you will almost always see an eagle on the reverse or the back side of the coin. Let's try to get a nice close up here. This coin is called the Morgan Dollar. And as you might guess, it's named the Morgan Dollar because the person who designed it is named Morgan. His name is George T. Morgan. And this is a picture of him. This is actually a, a great picture if you uh, Google George Morgan and try to find a good, large version of this picture. It's, uh, it's a fantastic picture. It, from the chair to the sculpture that he's working on to the slightly out-of-focus uh, 
items in the background. It just looks like a window into another time. It's like there's nothing electrical in this picture. It looks like there's nothing that's powered. It's all just uh, from another, another era. It's just a fantastic picture. An interesting thing about Morgan is that he was born in England. see how we should do this. I can put him down here while we look at the coins. Morgan was born in England and worked at the British Royal Mint after art school. Let's see how many more of these do we have? And here's one. Morgan was born in 1845. And around 1876, the director of the U.S. Mint was looking for some new blood to help come up with a, a whole new design for a U.S. silver dollar. Because the designs that he was getting seemed too derivative of previous designs. And so the director of the mint called the, the deputy master of the Royal Mint in England looking for a referral. And the deputy master offered up George Morgan's name. And so Morgan came to the United States and started at the U.S. Mint in 1876. And he went on to become the seventh chief engraver of the U.S. Mint. And he held that position from 1917 to 1925. But he designed this coin long before he was the chief engraver. He designed this in 1878 and the coin went on to be minted from 1878 to 1904. It is written that Morgan intentionally tried to depict what he called an American woman rather than the usual Greek style figures that were typically used. And a friend of Morgan's recommended a local Philadelphia school teacher named Anna Williams as a model, and Morgan went on to remark that he felt that her profile was the most perfect he'd ever seen. So 
these are the Morgan dollars. George Morgan. So the other large dollar coins that we have here are these. How many of these do we have? Looks like we have five of these. Let's take a close look. This one is a little bit rough looking on the reverse. Let's see if we can find some better ones. This is called the Peace Dollar. And its designer is a man named Anthony de Franchisi. Which you probably guessed was born in Italy. Similar to the Morgan dollar, you have a depiction of Liberty on the front and another eagle on the back. And it might be a little hard to see on this one, but at the very bottom of the reverse, on the mound that the eagle is standing on is the word peace. Peace was the design theme for this coin. And this is De Francisi. He was born in Italy in 1887. and uh, came to the U.S. in 1905. He worked with other sculptors who did commissions for the U.S. Mint, such as James Earl Fraser and Adolph Weinman, who we will talk about a little later. He taught at Columbia University and had his own sculpting studio and uh, started taking commissions for the U.S. Mint. He was actually one of eight sculptors in 1921 who were invited to compete to design a new U.S. dollar with the theme Peace Coin after the end of uh, World War I. Any of you who have ever worked uh, in trying to write requirements for contracts will get a kick out of the, the description in the uh, contest. The rules ask the uh, sculptors to depict the head of liberty and to make it as beautiful 
and full of character as possible. Now, character and beauty are abstract terms, are they not? Hard to measure whether you've been successful at that, but that's what they tried to do. Franchisi was the youngest sculptor in that contest at the age of 34. And his wife, uh, Teresa, was the model for Liberty. He originally came up with two designs for the reverse of the coin. One had a, a more warlike eagle standing on a broken sword, and one was much like this, uh, a more conventional eagle standing with an olive branch. And in one of the meetings with the director of the Mint, the director asked whether the broken sword could be moved to the design with the olive branch so that the design would have both the olive branch and the broken sword. And when the description of that design was published in the newspapers, there was quite an outcry. Because the broken sword symbolism was seen as a sign of defeat or surrender. So they went back and removed the sword before the coins were finally struck. The peace coin was uh, struck from 1921 to 1928. And then again in 34 and 35. This was also the last uh, U.S. dollar coin that was struck in 90% silver for circulation. Anthony de Francesi with the peace dollar. I wonder if we should go from largest coin size to smallest. I mean the physical size of the coin. If we did that, then I think these would be next. Let's see. Looks like we have five, no, four of these. Let's see what the best looking two are. Maybe the 
that one. Hmm, it's hard to say. Let's take a look at these. This is the Walking Liberty Half Dollar. The, uh, you've seen this in videos before. The ring that I wear on my right hand is made from a Walking Liberty Half Dollar. If I turn it, you can see See Liberty's head right there, and the uh, you can see the letter E in Liberty right by her head in the ring. That's right here. Now, this coin was designed by a German sculptor named Adolf Weinmann. This is Mr. Weinmann. Looking very distinguished in this picture. I think I see a pocket watch chain on the vest here, which is always nice. We'll put Mr. Weinman over here to observe. The thing is, though, if we're going to talk about Adolf Weinman, not only do we need to look at these coins, but we also need to look at this coin. Because he designed this one too. Now I only have one of these. So we have to look at the, uh, the sides in turn. This is uh, what is commonly called the Mercury Dime. He designed both of these coins. Weinman was born in 1870 in Germany, like I mentioned. came to the U.S. at age 10, did a lot of apprenticing and working in other studios and started his own in 1904. The interesting thing that I found in several accounts about Weinman is that even though he's most remembered these days as a medalist, you know, someone who worked in metal design or coin design, he was very adamant about being thought of as an architectural sculptor. That's really where he saw his artistic identity. And he's done a lot of work in a few state capitals and buildings around Manhattan and New York, including the New York Penn Station, which was demolished in the 60s. The 
the thing about these two coins is that, well, one interesting thing as I as I move them around in my hands is that they have a decidedly more subtle sound. Some of that might be dirt. They definitely don't speak the same way the dollar coins did. Maybe it's partly because of dirt and partly because of their size. But there was another design contest in 1916 and Weinman and two others were invited to submit designs for a new dime, quarter, and half dollar. And Weinman's designs won for two of those coins. And it is thought that both the Liberty design on the half dollar and on the dime were based on the same bust that Weinman sculpted three years earlier of a woman named Elsie Stevens. The thing about the half dollar, unfortunately, is that it was a, a troublesome design to strike. The mint always had a little bit of trouble bringing out the full detail in uh, Weinman's design. There were even small revisions by the, uh, the following two chief engravers of the mint, and but none, the problems were not completely solved. It was just always a little bit tough to get the design to strike distinctly. And as for the dime, this is one of my favorite U.S. coin designs. But the, uh, the funny thing about the Mercury dime is that it's a bit of a... Well, the name is a bit misleading because um, this isn't Mercury. makes sense when you think about it, right? Why would a Roman god be on a U.S. coin? Now this is, uh, this is Liberty, but uh, she's wearing a winged Phrygian cap, which got her confused with the Roman god Mercury. Weinman uh, said that uh, he felt that the winged cap symbolized liberty of thought. So the more correct name for this coin is the winged liberty head dime. And here's a close-up of the reverse. One dime. So these are the Adolf Weinman designs. And the dapper Adolf Weinman. Let's put the Weinman coins right there. I guess if we're going by size, we want to look at this coin next. This is the Franklin half dollar. Now 
This coin was struck between 1948 and 1963. Ben Franklin on the front, of course. And a rather prominent Liberty Bell on the back. And this design came from a man named John Sinnock. Here's a picture of Sinnock with the uh, director of the Mint, Nellie Ross. This was very late in his tenure as the eighth chief engraver of the Mint, and they're looking at uh, the designs of the Roosevelt dime here in this picture. But we're not looking at Roosevelt dimes today. But he is responsible for this. He was born in uh, New Mexico in 1888. Became a, an assistant engraver at the Philadelphia Mint in 1917 and became chief engraver in 1925. A couple of interesting things about this coin, or things that I thought were interesting. If you look at the, if you look at the back, I told you that we'd be seeing a lot of eagles on the backs of these coins, but the one on the back of this coin is very small, off to the side of the Liberty Bell here. It almost looks like it was added as an afterthought, and according to what I've read, that is very, very much what happened. Because apparently officials at the Mint kind of forgot, perhaps, that the uh, Coinage Act of 1873 required an eagle to be displayed on the back of uh, all coins of greater value than a dime, I think, or all coins that are struck in silver and gold, I think. It's one of those two. But this must have happened at a time when the, the Liberty Bell design was nearly finished, so they stuck the eagle off to the side there. <laughs> it's, it's kind of conspicuous how small it is, I think. Another very interesting thing, and I don't know that we'll be able to see it here, can barely see at the at the bottom edge of the the Franklin bust Sinox initials which are JRS right above where my fingernail is very hard to see there were some complaints at the time from some conspiracy theorists that Sinnock's initials were actually the initials of Joseph Stalin placed there by some Kremlin infiltrator within the Mint
there were uh, similar complaints uh, from his initials on the Roosevelt dime as well. Apparently some people wrote in demanding to know how the Mint had discovered that Stalin had a middle name. Needless to say, the accusations were met with uh, what were called outraged official denials. The Franklin Half Dollar and John Sinnock. Let's see. We're getting a smaller and smaller pile in the middle, and it's harder to make good coin sounds when we're running out of coins. That brings us to this half dollar here. Now, if you remember the treasure chest video, you'll remember that Mom's cedar box already had a lot of Kennedy half dollars in it. There were a ton of them, actually. She was a big fan of Kennedy's. But I included this one in this collection of coins rather than the other because of the year and the composition. The Kennedy half dollar was begun in 1964, early 1964, very shortly after Kennedy's assassination in November of 63. And when we talk about the design of this coin, we have to talk about two men. Because the front of this coin was designed by Gilroy Roberts. Who is this gentleman? And the reverse of this coin was designed by Frank Gasparro, who is this gentleman. And I must say that I love pictures of these engravers with sculptures of their coinage work on big boards like this. I think this is just fantastic. I love seeing the guys at work creating this art that we went on to carry in our pockets for decades. But to be reminded that this artwork was not always just super small little tokens, but large, nearly life-size sculptures is uh, is good context to have I think Roberts here on the left was born in uh, 1905 in Philadelphia his father was a sculptor and so he started 
sculpting at a young age. He started at the Mint at, at the age of 31 as an assistant engraver, but he left after only a year and a half, and he went to work at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to work on postage and revenue stamps. And then he came back to the Mint in 44 as the uh, top assistant under Chief Engraver John Sinnock, who we just talked about. And after Sinnock passed away, uh, Roberts was appointed the ninth Chief Engraver in uh, 1948. And then Gasparo, who did the reverse, well, he was the tenth chief engraver of the Mint. He was born in Philadelphia in 1909. His father was a musician, and he wanted Gasparo to be a musician like him which I think is interesting. You never hear about parents wanting their kids to be musicians. But I'm a part-time musician, so I can, I can make that joke. He studied uh, at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and studied in Europe and uh, joined the Mint in 1942 uh, under John Sinnock again. And uh, Gasparo was the chief engraver until, well, starting in 65 and all the way until 1981, and he designed a lot of modern U.S. coinage, including both sides of the Susan B. Anthony dollar and both sides of the Eisenhower dollar and the Lincoln Memorial reverse of the penny. So you have definitely carried around Frank Gasparro's work if you live in the United States. The thing about this coin, a couple of interesting bits they really hurried this coin into production because you know, Kennedy was very popular and his assassination was very shocking. And five days, if I'm if I remember right, five days after the uh, uh, the assassination, the Mint had congressional authorization to go forward with a. Kennedy design. And what's interesting is that Roberts and Gasparo had already been working on the, uh, the U.S. Mint Presidential Medal featuring Kennedy. So they repurposed that work and used it for the half dollar to expedite the process. The irony, though, is that the coin was in very, very high demand, but they had a really hard time getting it into circulation. It started being uh, minted in 1964 in 90% silver, and the coins were hoarded by collectors and sometimes melted for their silver value because silver prices were on the rise at this time. This is kind of a stunning statistic, but in, in an effort to try to, I guess, saturate 
the market and get these coins finally into circulation. The mint struck 430 million coins that were dated 1964. And I know that's hard to put into context by itself. But 430 million coins was more than all of the Franklin half dollars that had been struck in the entire run of the Franklin half dollar, which was the prior 16 years. They put out more Kennedy half dollars dated 1964 than the prior 16 years worth of Franklin half dollars. But the reason I include this coin, the 1965, is that they changed the composition in this year to a 40% silver composition. It actually has a core that's about 21% silver and 79% copper, and then it's got a plating on the outside that's 80% silver and 20% copper, and that adds up to a coin with 40% silver content. So I include this coin in the old coins pile, even though mom had a ton of them that we looked at in the other video. So that is the Kennedy half dollar. From the design team if you will, of Gilroy Roberts, Frank Gasparro. Let's see. Not much left. I guess if we're still going by size, then These three are next. Some of you will hopefully recognize these coins because they're a somewhat iconic design. This is the Indian head nickel or sometimes called the Buffalo Nickel. These were struck from 1913 to 1938. And they were designed by a sculptor by the name of James Earl Fraser. Here's a picture of Fraser. Now this is one of my favorite American coin designs. The three Specimens that I have here, however, are very worn, which was a bit of a problem for the design in circulation, actually. So I have a piece of paper here. Just for reference to see a little bit more what the detail of Fraser's design looked like 
without the where. The thing about Fraser is that his father was a engineer that worked for the railroad out in the western states during the westward expansion and that exposed Fraser to frontier life as well as uh, the Native American experience which informed, you know, some of his later work. He did a, a very famous piece called End of the Trail with a uh, Indian on a horse, as well as the work he did here on this nickel. This, uh, this design was commissioned in 1911 by the Taft administration to replace a, uh, a nickel called the Liberty Head nickel. Fraser uh, said that he wanted to create a totally American design, a, a coin that could not be mistaken for any other country's coin. The, uh, the Indian the Indian head design on the obverse here is said to be a, a combination, kind of an amalgam of the characteristics of at least three different Indian faces that he was aware of. I think it's a fantastic and evocative design, but it was very hard to strike. It was very indistinct. It uh, consumed dyes, the, the dyes that are used to actually strike the, the coins themselves. It consumed dyes at three times the rate of the nickel that it replaced. And like we mentioned before, it was really prone to wear in circulation particularly the date. Here, let's get the other one up here. You'll notice that of these three that I have, you can't tell the date on any of them. The date would be right here on the shoulder of the Indian and all of these are worn completely smooth And the denomination, the, the area that says five cents on the back, uh, was also very prone to wear. And uh, there were minor design revisions to try to correct this also, but uh, they were generally unsuccessful and the coin was replaced in 1938. Fraser was uh, one of the sculptors who just did commissions for the U.S. Mint. He never actually worked in the Mint as a chief engraver. He was a notable U.S. sculptor. and uh, He did a ton of monument uh, work in Washington, D.C., including uh, pieces at the Supreme Court, and the National Archives and uh, the U.S. Treasury, just to name a few. He did the sculpture of Alexander Hamilton that stands at the U.S. Treasury. Everybody loves Alexander Hamilton these days. The Indian Head Nickel. or the buffalo nickel. By 
James Earl Fraser. Well, that only leaves one final coin. And it's this, this poor little coin here. This poor coin is so worn. that you can barely tell what it was. You can, you can kind of see the number five on this side. And you can kind of see something that looks like a shield on this side. And those two things are just enough to tell us that this poor guy is what is known as a shield nickel. Now since this thing is hopelessly worn, I brought some help. This is what the shield nickel would have looked like when it was freshly minted. Looks a lot better, doesn't it? But this shield nickel was designed by the fourth chief engraver of the U.S. Mint, a guy named James B. Longacre. This is a self-portrait done by Longacre. Longacre was the chief engraver from 1844 to 1869. He was born in Pennsylvania in 1794 but he ran away from home at the age of 12 and ran off to Philadelphia to start apprenticing in a bookstore. Ran away at the age of 12. You imagine the grit and the pluck young James Longacre must have had. He eventually went on to work in an engraving firm once his artistic talents began to develop. And he made a name for himself, creating illustrations for popular biographical book series, which eventually led him to create illustrations of President Andrew Jackson and former president, James Madison. Became the chief engraver of the mint and went on to design coins such as the flying eagle scent, the Indian head scent, and this guy, the shield nickel. Some interesting thing about the shield nickel is that it's the first five cent piece to be made of the, the same copper nickel alloy that's used in nickels today. Before this, they were made of 90% silver again. 
It was also the first five-cent piece to be called a nickel because the silver five-cent pieces before this were called half-dimes. The shield on the reverse was meant to convey the strength of a unified America post-Civil War. The shield nickel minted from 1866 to 1883, designed by James Longacre. That's all of Mom's old coins and all of their engravers. Let's see if we can't get them all in frame for the conclusion of this video, shall we? Let's see. Got Morgan and De Franchisi. Let's see here. Let's do a little arranging here. do we have? have Weinman. Like so. Roberts and Gasparo put the Kennedy half dollar right in between. We have Fraser. And there we have it. A small collection of older American coinage, but perhaps more importantly, the names and the faces of the artists, the sculptors, the engravers, who applied their creativity behind the scenes, all a part of their job, but certainly no less artistic than things you would find on the wall in an art museum.
all applied to practical pieces that contribute to the convenience of our day-to-day -day lives, but that, as a result, are oftentimes ignored or taken for granted. Thanks so much for being with me in this video, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Take care, and see you soon. Bye-bye.